In yesterday's video, I talked about how inclusive language functions as aristocratic language. Its deliberate opaqueness serves as a barrier between those with the correct politics and the normies who are browbeat with overeducated redefinitions not based in reality any time they step out of line. I mentioned specifically that this mentality trickles down from academia into other institutions, often with hilarious or ridiculous results. Let's take a look at some examples. You know, part of me misses the days when all we had to worry about was forced gender neutrality upon things that didn't need it, like manhole turning into maintenance hole. I remember hearing as a kid, fireman and policeman becoming firefighter and police officer, and thinking, okay, that makes sense. If there are women qualified to be in those jobs, why not? But then it went off the rails. Sorority and fraternity should be called the collegiate Greek system residence, eh? In an effort to be trans-friendly, a hospital is advising nurses to no longer use words such as breastfeeding and breast milk. Human milk and chest milk are the more acceptable terms for midwives to use. Gosh, starting off strong, eh? This video ain't getting monetized. Hit up my subscribe star and Patreon, everybody. Also, um, human milk has a completely different alternate meaning. One that I would hope doesn't involve babies drinking it. Do vulva owners like sex? It's the wrong question. Here's what you should ask instead. Oh, I can think of a few questions already, like, do you mean women? Or why am I reading this nonsense? What's the short answer? It depends on the person. Some do like sex and some don't. Just like some penis owners like sex and some don't. You know, I'm actually like picturing a female esports person with the nickname the penis owner because she's got a reputation for smack talking guys during the match and then winning and bragging about it. Does that mean that vulva owners and penis owners are truly wired differently? I think you've gotta be wired differently to even write this thing, man. It's not even inaccurate so far. It's all biologically on point, but it feels like they ran a word replace script and input vulva owner and penis owner. For centuries, those with vulvas have had their sex and sexuality controlled by those with penises. This likely started in the agricultural age when women's bodies were traded for land. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It didn't start because people traded women's bodies for land. It started because men's prehistorical burden is to work. And if men were going to work, they wanted at least some guarantee that the children they were working for were theirs. So institutions like marriage and monogamy helped provide this assurance. Most men were not these gigachads with 50 concubines. Most men were like most women. They were married and that was that. Hey fellow ovary owners and PCOS strugglers, ovary owners is degrading and dehumanizing, come on now. So is female, girls, ladies, sisters, and any other transphobic slur that denies one their fundamental rights to their own gender identity. Trans people have the right to not have their gender identity erased. All right, so we just can't call anything anything then. We can't use a term to identify a thing because that's othering. We just need to pretend that nothing exists and everything is everything. Stop calling it female genital mutilation. Vulvas aren't inherently female. If you call it FG GM, you're a bigot. Bye, turfs. I wonder if this is the person who wrote the vulva owners article from earlier. Also, this take doesn't even make sense. If woman is the gender role and female is the biological sex, how are vulvas not inherently female? I thought the whole trans thing wasn't about saying biological sexes aren't real. The reason that a phrase like born biologically male is so upsetting to trans people is, number one, biology is a lot more complicated than you were taught in high school. And number two, false concepts of what is biologically true for human beings has been used as a tool of oppression for our whole history. Oh, never mind then. I guess some of the more radical trans activists really are about denying biological sex outright. Oh wow, a new campaign has been launched in support of genderless menstrual leave. People who bleed. I wish I still worked a normie job. I'd claim one week off every month for menstruation. Hell yeah. I mean, literally everybody is a person who bleeds, so why not? Here's probably the craziest example of all this I've come across so far. Buckle up. Vagina is when it's surgically constructed out of a penis. Front hole is when we were born with it. Holy shit, do you hear that? That, cis woman, you've all got front holes now. Vagina is a word only for post-op trans women now. Vagina. We use this word to talk about the genitals of trans women who have had bottom surgery. Oh no, we fucking don't. That's not how any of this works. Like, I remember when this sort of a thing was a fucking joke. 
I remember when Borat called his butthole a back pussy. What the fuck is wrong with you? Here's the issue with all of this stuff. Yes, you're making things more inclusive, but you're also stripping the word of meaning in the process. For example, the word spouse might be a gender neutral alternative for husband, but spouse doesn't have the extra emotional attachment that husband has. Spouse is a legal term. Husband is a position that a man occupies with certain duties, expectations, privileges, and rewards. Same with wife. Same with partner replacing boyfriend and girlfriend. And sibling replacing brother and sister. And parent replacing father and mother. Because it turns out, women and men aren't exactly the same at all times. Oh god, check out this list of gender neutral terms. Ren replaces mum and dad? I've never heard this before. I've heard parent, not Ren. ZZ for aunt and uncle? Nibbling for niece and nephew? Really, Nibba? Prinks for prince and princess? Latinx strikes again. It was a trans person who posted this to my timeline with the caption, please just misgender me, which is the same energy as Lilith saying, it's less insulting to call me a man than a womaxin. Most people, even most trans people, don't want this shit. For a long time, the actual real measures to force this nonsense was relegated to the stupid put your pronouns in your bio or else crowd. Those people were annoying but easily ignorable. But then it became culturally popular to cancel people who pushed back against this imposition. And then it became an offense to use normal everyday speech. And then cringy holidays about these pronouns became the norm. And then people began to reap social credit for simply adding a they into their bio. And then the police began promoting it actively. Being misgendered can have a huge impact on somebody and their personal well-being. It also can be used as a form of abuse for somebody and that just isn't right. Today is about raising awareness, getting people to have conversations and understanding why it is so important to understand the pronouns that somebody wishes to be used for them. And then the police began to be called on people who didn't comply with it. It's not compelled speech, just shut up. Do you even hear yourself? It's not violating your free speech rights. Just don't speak, five head. And what is all this in service of? The redefinitions, the new speak, the rigid enforcement of pronouns to the point that the cops are being called up. What's it all for? Well, any progressive can answer that one. It's to minimize trauma, apparently. The claim is, if you're not using a trans person's preferred pronouns, regardless of how obviously outlandish they are, or if you're not using gender neutral terminology, even if it sounds ridiculous to your ears to say, or if you're making any reference to biology insofar as sex and gender are concerned, you are inflicting new traumas on marginalized people, you're triggering their past traumas, and you're hindering their recovery. Maybe you're listening to all this and thinking, ha, ah, trauma? It's just hurt feelings. Is being offended a traumatic experience now? Well, <laughs> I don't think so. But let's actually consider the possibility. My video on the pronouns wiki included a funny throwaway joke that we should actually take a bit of a closer look at. At the end of it, I said, shut up and do your dishes, while presenting this picture. When you ask your NB, that means non-binary, roommate with a noun for a name to clean up after themselves, then they post a GoFundMe to get out of their abusive housing situation. This reminds me of an old, old viral post. I can't find it now. It's been lost to the depths of the internet. Where a woman was living with an abusive boyfriend. But what made him abusive was that he asked her to get a job. She said something like, I'm an abuser survivor. I got out. Know that you're not alone. And it's like, dude, are you really just out here weaponizing the language of trauma because you're too lazy to pick up after yourself or contribute to the household? Well, that abusive housing situation from last time is actually a viral TikTok. Of course, how could it not be? And the replies to it are gold. A lot of them are people screeching transphobia because apparently it's transphobic to not want to live in a fucking toilet. Ask yourself why all the replies contain transphobia. The answer is because where you see trans person, I see overgrown child. But some replies contain their own stories, like this one. Gotta get out of this they-them household. One of my roommates gets away with never doing dishes, citing housing trauma that makes them hypersensitive to people asking them to do dishes. Honestly, kinda alpha. I was mulling it over in my head for a while, thinking, do these people actually experience trauma when being asked to do the dishes? Or is it just laziness and they know they're being lazy and they're hiding behind the language of trauma? And I've come to the conclusion that it's both. They're certainly lazy. They're your dishes. You do them. There's no reason anybody else should be obligated to pick up after you. But they're probably also a little traumatized. And to be traumatized from such a minute amount of pushback as please do your own dishes means that they're the most sheltered, spoiled, middle-aged infants that our species has ever produced. You should be getting over being told to clean up your own messes when you're like 10 years old. Unless, of course, you never got told and constantly had it done for you. 
It can be legitimately traumatic to have to learn a child's lessons at 25 or 30 or 35 years old. And I do think that a general extended childhood and extended adolescence means that people get traumatized by things that, even if they're not good or positive, they should be used to by now. Let me give you an example of this. This is a short clip that went viral last year of a nerdy girl getting hit on by a guy. She includes captions at different parts of the video describing how she feels at certain moments, which I'll read out for you when they pop up, just in case you're doing audio only on this video. Here we go. Hey, how are you? Um, hey. Oh yeah, you can take that. Mm -hmm. How you doing? Oh, I didn't mean you could sit there. I thought you said I could take this. What did you mean I could take? You could take the chair. Oh. I was asking if this seat was taken. Oh, no. May I? Um, I don't know. What are you doing? Um, I'm doing all right. Good. That's good. Yeah. That's, that's better than the contrary. Mm-hmm. Awesome. What's your name? It's a fake um, name. Alyssa. Alyssa, I'm Tad. Thank you. The no thank you is in reply to a handshake. I see your hesitancy. Yeah. I just, I just, I couldn't help but notice you were the only one hanging out over here. My yeah, heart is beating out of my chest right now. Over here by the pool. I don't see anybody else over here. You're yeah. Like, hang out with you. Um, I'm currently... Maybe he'll leave me alone uh, if I say I'm live. On a, on a live, talking with some people. Right, I got you. I, got you. Yeah. I won't interrupt. Thank you. He leans back, but then he leaves as he sees I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> this is nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> the man that saves me is a friend watching from the balcony. Yeah. Man, that was cringe. I cringed watching it, I cringed writing this part of the script, I'm cringing while recording it, and I bet I'm gonna cringe while editing it too. That was one cringy interaction. But let's think about it for a bit. The woman who took the video uses the language, the man that saves me is a friend. He saved you from a cringy interaction, sure. But as far as I can remember, this person who posted the video later claimed to be traumatized by this event. Let's lay it out in as much autistic detail as I can. From the guy's point of view, it should have been very obvious that she was uncomfortable, and he should have picked up that she wasn't interested much sooner than he did. The encounter lasts maybe a minute and 30 seconds. He probably should have figured it out at around the 30 second mark. But you know what? He showed up, he shot his shot, he failed, and then he left. He didn't cause a scene, he didn't insult her, he was polite, he said, got it, have a nice day, and he took off. I don't think this qualifies as a traumatic experience. It's cringy and uncomfortable, sure, but not traumatic. He got the point and left pretty quick. Maybe not quick enough to avoid being turned into a viral video, but certainly not on the level of inflicting trauma. Like, if this was some kind of an incredibly challenging event for her, she's gotta either have some past trauma that she hasn't dealt with, or she's never, ever, ever, ever been in an awkward situation in her life and doesn't know how to deal with things. I feel like in my day, yeah, here's your boomer dev story, but in my day, if this shit happened when I was in high school, the worst of it would be that the girl would laugh with her friends about this creepy guy who tried to pick her up and didn't get the hint and it was kind of weird and that would be the end of it but nowadays it's more like i'll get back to you guys one sec while i schedule an emergency session with my fucking therapist after i instagram and tweet out this horrifically traumatizing encounter which serves as even more proof that women are relegated to second class citizens in today's white patriarchal capitalist society things that push back on you even things that make you legitimately uncomfortable do not necessarily cause trauma but because there is this progressive compulsion to blame systems for every single problem rather than individuals Systemic change is what's needed and people have no agency themselves because they're oppressed. We've got an entire group of people who have exactly zero tools to deal with even the most minimally invasive situations. This is the case with anything progressive. The feminists who are legally of age but still act like 12-year-old retarded children because they want empowerment and equality when it suits them, but they don't want the responsibility and agency that comes with it. Black activists who screech and cry about racism but are racist towards white people, and rather than fix their shitty behavior, they redefine the word racist to make them blameless. Trans activists who move beyond the reasonable ask of let me transition because it alleviates my dysphoria off into the craziest self-ID shit I've ever heard. At the end of the day, it's all in the name of trauma, of harm reduction. For these people, if useful labels or categories have to go, if free speech has to go, then so be it. 
No, really, they outright say it. You can apply any label to yourself while ignoring its requirements. Then what the fuck is the point of the label? Also, implicit in this idea is that if you apply a label to yourself, even with zero justification, I am now required to honor that, no matter how ridiculous. All in the name of preventing trauma. When most of the time, the trauma is literally just the pain of learning an uncomfortable life lesson 20 years too late. But I just don't agree with this. It would be polite of me to use your pronouns, but you don't get to compel me to do it. And there's no reason anybody should comply with these obviously politically biased redefinitions and replacements of perfectly functional words. Here is what complying gets you. You become party to a culture of weakness, where for a large swath of young people nowadays, trauma is no longer considered a horrible thing to overcome, but a permanent part of their personality, something to show off, something to put in their Twitter bio. You contribute to the mechanisms that control a traumatized population for another group's own political and personal gain. Like, for example, the BLM organization, which exists solely to enrich its operators with the donations of self-hating white leftists, using the legitimate trauma of the black community as an excuse to do so. And you contribute to the dumbing down of the language of trauma, such that actual victims of trauma have their legitimately horrific experiences correlated with man-children who hyperventilate trying to order a pizza over the phone. All of that is too high a price to pay in exchange for a drop of temporary comfort, quickly consumed and forgotten about by the most coddled generation of human beings to ever grace this planet.